Hey guys, before we get started on the video, I wanted to take just a moment to acknowledge the terrible events that took place in just the last week. The murder of six Asian women and two others in Atlanta, which comes after a year or so in which we've seen a rise in anti-Asian bigotry and hate crimes in America, and then the murder of at least 10 people in Colorado just this week in uh, yet, in, yet another mass shooting. We lament these tragedies and the growing trend of racist and bigoted attacks specifically on the Asian American community like we saw in Atlanta. And we're sadly all very used to the tragedy of mass shootings here. Nevertheless, we also lament this one in Colorado. We pray for the families, we pray for the victims, and that the families might feel some sort of peace and comfort through this unspeakable tragedy. I just want to let you know that Christ Presbyterian Church and CPC Student Ministry stands firmly with and behind our Asian American friends and family and firmly committed to our denomination's stance to be a people of peace and not a people of violence. In addition, I wanted to point you to some resources if you're looking to help out, get educated, be a better ally for the Asian American Pacific Islander community, or if you want to learn about the facts uh, of gun violence in America and what we can do about them as a people of faith. In the description of this video, you're going to find links to a handful of great organizations working in this specific issue area, both here in Madison and nationwide. This is, of course, not a comprehensive list, so if you have any suggestions, please feel free to share. We've also included a link to a reflection from Pastor Eric Lou of Press House right here in Madison, who is a partner of CPC. They're one of our mission partners. And in her reflection, she reflects on her experience as an Asian woman living here in America. It's a difficult but a powerful read. And it frankly needs to be heard, heard by more white Christians. For the gun violence thing, you'll find a link to the Presbyterian Church USA's gun violence prevention office and a slew of resources that they offer. You know, it feels like every day we wake up to some new fresh hell that we have to just wrestle with yet again and try to just get through the day. And I certainly don't have any or all of the answers, it feels like. But I just want to encourage you to continue to love people as Jesus loves us selflessly and sacrificially. And in doing so continue to work together for the healing of the world, just like Jesus calls us to do each and every day. So with that, here's this week's video. Hi there, you little chicken nuggets. It's me, presidential candidate Carl here. In today's world, people are using language about as colorful as Joseph's robe. <laughs> Technicolor. <laughs> but as Christians, we're held to a higher standard. We're told to watch what we say. After all, our tongue is an udder, rudder. But what happens when we step on a Lego, stub our toe, or when my cousin Mikhail calls you and complains that you left the front door open while she was on vacation, and that time a pack of raccoons infested her house, and she blames you for it, then what are you gonna say? Profanity? <laughs> no. So may I present to you, church hacks, Christian cussing, and expressions. Song of Solomon on Sunday. Son of a number seven. Simon, son of Jonah. Holy Advocare, Crowder Chowder. Golly, Lord, they gonna bagel. Oh, Mother Pharaoh. No oh, potluck. Profanity! Cuss! Mother of manna. Locust and honey on a hilltop. I cannot believe that. Fireproof! For the love of Kanye's salvation. Noah's kneecaps. Branch's chain on the fish line. That's terrible. Dare you to move. Son of a Bathsheba. Bull chipping, Joanna. Shut the lion's mouth and call me, Daniel. Thieves and peppermint. Heaven's the Bethel. <laughs> ah! Rolling Rahab, water into wine on Easter Sunday. Hillsong on a stick. Holy Shadrach. Judas, kiss that hurt. I tell you what, she's saltier than Lot's wife. And that's salty. Paul on a wall, what is this guy doing? I tell you what, that guy's name must be Peter because he's in denial. Father, forgive them because they do not know how to use a blinker. For the love of homeschoolers, it's green. And all the people said, <laughs> Get off the road! I will drop you like Jericho's wall if you do that one more time. Waymaker, more like better make a way before I run you over. They call an ambulance because this video is going to be sick. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm praying forever who's hurt. Should we fall in? Well, 
Well, hey there, this is Carter. And this is Cece. And? Welcome to the announcements. We've got a lot of great stuff for you this week, starting with this. Okay, right first now. thing that you're gonna say is, on April 14th. Okay, on April 14th. Pastor Jessica is coming to youth group. Pastor Jessica is coming to youth group. On April 14th, she wants to come hang out with us, get to know you, and we're gonna have a good time. So make sure you mark that week, because that's gonna be a week you definitely wanna tune in and for sure wanna be at the Zoom after party. Speaking of, now we say, don't forget to come to the Zoom after the video. Don't forget to come to the Zoom and hit the subscribe button. No, hold on, say, say, don't forget to come to the Zoom after the video. Don't forget to come to the Zoom after the video. Very good. There is Bible study on Sunday. Yes, there is Bible study on Sunday. And the last thing is that this next week is Holy Week, which means that on Sunday, we have Palm Sunday, normal worship on Sunday morning, 10 a.m. on YouTube. On Thursday, we have a Maundy Thursday service, which is actually going to be on Zoom. And Friday... <laughs> And on Friday, we have the Good Friday service, which is on YouTube as well. All the information for that is either in the Wednesday Church email or in, on the church website, and you can check it all out there. I don't know what this girl's doing. She's going crazy. Do we have anything else to say, Cece? You want to show them anything? Yeah. Um, like what? So you guys know like Easter's coming up in like a week and a half or so. And um, at Easter, there's like one specific type of like candy that everybody has to have, Peeps. You know Peeps? Those weird marshmallows that like you only have a couple times a year that some people can't stand. I was at the store the other day with my lovely wife and she saw this thing, this ungodly creation that didn't descend, but ascended from the depths of hell. This new thing that is called Hot tamales, peeps, fierce cinnamon. And my wife turns to me, the mother of my three children, the apple of my eye, the person I have chosen to spend the rest of my days with. She turns to me and says, you should eat these for youth group, and then throws them in the cart. You know what, guys? It's been a hard year. No bueno, no good. I'm gonna try to give you a laugh. I don't know if it's gonna work. Maybe I'll give you just one of those like, or maybe a, and maybe you'll laugh. But I'm gonna try this thing here. Let's go. All right, popping them open. It's like you smell Satan's armpit. They're laughing at me. They know this is gonna be terrible. It's not good. Uh, mm, like some of the eyes are black and some of the eyes are brown. And sometimes on a singular peep, they're, they have one of each and it's a little weird. Here we go. This is super weird. Tell you what, they don't taste like tamales whatsoever. It tastes like, uh, like a marshmallow with some sugar on it, which is simultaneously great and a bummer because I like that they taste great, but I had this whole thing about eating a bitter food and I went with this and they're not bitter. And it was gonna be how I led into the topic of bitterness. By the way, did you know bitterness is our topic this week? I, I had this whole like bit ready to go about this and old hot tamale peeps had to ruin it. Oh well, it's a good thing I still have a killer segue. Ooh. You ever tasted anything really bitter before? I'm betting you probably have, maybe like some like spoiled milk. Ooh. Or since we're coming up on Holy Week and Passover, maybe you've been to a Seder meal and you've had to eat the horseradish. And trust me, if you know what that's like, you don't wanna think about it again. Well, bitter is often thought about only when it comes to food, but it actually has another meaning it has nothing to do with taste. It's about a feeling. 
to be bitter as a person means to be angry, hurt, or resentful because you think you've been treated poorly or unfairly. You might be tempted to become bitter, for example, when somebody hurts you, when somebody gets something that you wanted, or they're liked more, they're appreciated more, or treated better than you think they deserve. And at church, we often talk about people being, quote, lost. You'll often hear that in the context of people who don't know Jesus. But today we're going to discover that the people Jesus called lost aren't always the people we might expect. And it has to do with being bitter. This is the last week of our Lost and Found series where we've been looking at the chapter of the Bible, just one chapter, Luke 15. This chapter recounts a series of stories that Jesus once told about things that were lost and then found. And each story communicated a different truth. And each story communicated a different and important truth. And again, these stories aren't historical. That's not, the, that's not the point. They're parables. They're stories that Jesus made up in order to teach an important truth to somebody. And that somebody was the Pharisees. The religious leaders of the day who had become arrogant, they'd become self-righteous and dismissive of people who they believed were sinful. Jesus told this series of stories to help the Pharisees see how wrong they were about themselves, about others, and about God. So just to recap, first Jesus told a story about a lost sheep to show the Pharisees that God is not angry or judgmental with them when we wander away. Instead, God finds us and carries us back to safety. Next, Jesus tells a story about a woman and her lost coin to show the Pharisees that God doesn't give up on us when we wander away. And instead, God values us and keeps looking for us. After that, Jesus told a story about a son who selfishly left his family and squandered his money. But then he was welcomed home again by his father anyway. That's what we talked about last week. What we saw what was welcomed home, but was welcomed home again by his father anyway. We saw most of that story last week, but we're actually not finished with it yet. Here's the full story, including the part we saw last week from our friends at The Bible Project. There was a father who had two sons. The older son is trustworthy and honors his father. And the younger son, he's a mess. He rebels and cashes in his inheritance to travel far away and blow it all on partying and being stupid. And then there's a famine in the land and he runs out of money. So he has to scrape by by taking care of somebody's pigs. And he's so hungry, he wants to eat the pig slop, at which point it occurs to him, if I'm gonna be a farmhand, I might as well go home and work for my dad. At least I won't be eating pig food. So he treks back home, rehearsing his apology. Now, the father is certain that his son did not survive the famine. But then, one day, he sees someone walking down the road. It's his son. He's not dead. And so the father runs to him and embraces his son, kissing him all over. The son starts his speech. Dad, I don't deserve to be your son. Maybe I could come and work for you. But before he can finish, the father calls his servants to go get the nicest robe, new sandals, a fancy ring for his son. They are to prepare the best food for a banquet. It is time to celebrate. Now later that day, the older brother arrives from a long day working in the field to discover his long lost loser of a brother has come home and they're celebrating. And he gets angry. And think about it. He's been faithful to his father all of these years. He never got a party like this. And then this disgrace of a family member comes home and they're going to celebrate him? It's disgusting. He refuses to join the banquet. So the father finds the older brother outside and he says, Son, you are already in our family. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate your brother because he was lost and now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. So like we talked about last week, one of the things that we can learn from this story is that Jesus always welcomes us back, no matter how far we wander from him. And I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing the Pharisees thought that like that was the end of the story. And if I were them, I might be thinking, okay, we get it. God loves everyone and is happy when all the lost sheep, all the lost coins and all the lost sons come home. Got it. You could stop telling stories now, right? We get it, Jesus, move on. But as we just saw, Jesus' story has a twist. You see, Jesus' goal in telling these stories was not only to help the Pharisees be more compassionate about the lost people. He needed them to see that they were the lost ones. And that's why this story is not really about the younger brother like we often think. This story is about the older brother. So as we just saw, the father's response to the younger brother deeply upsets the older brother. And he could not believe that his little brother came back and was accepted instead of punished. He was frustrated that he had done everything right but nobody ever threw a party for him. He didn't want to celebrate that his brother was back. He just wanted to like sulk in the unfairness of it all. 
In short, the older brother was bitter. He felt like he'd earned his father's love and that his rebellious and untrustworthy little brother didn't deserve it. And I've felt that way before, maybe you have too. But what the father says to the elder brother here is so important. Let's check that out again. You are always with me and everything I have is yours. I mean, of all lines that Jesus could have put on the God character here, he chooses that one. He's telling the elder brother, listen, man, you've been at the party the whole time and you didn't even know it. You've been so stuck in your rule keeping, your religiousness, your focus on who's in and who's out and who deserves what, that you didn't realize that you were at the party this whole time. And with that, the father is inviting the elder brother to join the party and celebrate how both sons have been lost, but now they are found. So this series of stories in Luke 15 is, in my opinion, the core of the gospel. It's the core of Jesus' teaching on how we are to relate to God and how God relates to us. And here in Luke chapter 15, we start to see that Maybe everything we've ever thought about God is wrong. I mean, think about the stories that we've heard in this chapter. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, which again, is not just about one of these sons, it's about both, and about how they're lost in different ways. Think about who the main focus is in each story, the main character. In the lost sheep, the main character is not the shepherd, because the whole story turns on the sheep who was lost. And what did they do to be found? Nothing. In the lost coin, what did the coin do to be found? didn't do anything. The story turns on the coin's lost state. Now, the younger son does do something. He comes home, but he returns home under the assumption that he won't be welcomed back in to that same status that he had before. He's coming back thinking he's going to be a servant, a slave, low on the totem pole. And the father goes way beyond just letting him back. He goes way beyond and he throws this extravagant party. All three stories turn on the lack of action of the three main characters in each story. The sheep would have stayed lost, the coin would have stayed lost, and the son would have come home and just been a slave. But the shepherd went and found the sheep and brought it back. The woman found the coin and rejoiced. The father lavished extravagance on the son and reminded the elder brother that he is already at the party he just doesn't realize it yet. See, the younger son believes he's no longer worthy to be at that party because of what he's done. The older brother believes he is worthy to be at the party for what he's done. And the problem is, they're both wrong because they misunderstand the very nature of their father's love. See, God's love is not based on anything we can do. We cannot earn it. We also cannot have it be taken from us. It just is. The worst thing you've done in your life, your deepest, darkest secret, is totally irrelevant in the shadow of the cross. Likewise, all the right things that you've done trying to appease the angry God in the sky, irrelevant, they don't matter. Because if the point of the gospel is that you have to please the deity somewhere by accomplishing some kind of vague task, then I don't think that's actually good news. But I actually think the good news is better than that. The good news is that you are already at the party and that you are already enough. So what are you gonna do? You gonna stay outside sulking or are you gonna join the party? What gift of love could I offer to a king? What weight or worth could be held within my offering? When he alone is worthy A glory song is inscribed upon my heart This treasure held in an alabaster jar I break To bring him all the glory Praise God from whom all blessings flow Praise Him, all creatures here below. What sacrifice could be equal to His own? The cross of Christ has declared that there is naught I owe. Yet I know I owe 